words. Yeah, well, yeah. being a gay man, a lot of my story is going to be repeated by other people. But uh, growing up in Covington, Kentucky, which is, uh, you know, uh, the heart of the Midwest or the, the most northern point of the South, uh, I didn't have a problem in school. Uh, effeminate men were singled out and made fun of in movies and became caricatures and a stereotypical thing for humor. And everyone kind of accepted that. And uh, we were all aware of that kind of thing, sissy boys or whatever names they gave to them. And I didn't have a problem in school. Uh, I never really thought about it much because you become aware of who you are as you mature. And your glands start maturing and you find what you're attracted to. But I remember in junior high, uh, I got up and performed at my sister's homeroom program, which they held in the auditorium, and I danced. And from that point on, it was like about, I would say, the eighth grade. From that point on, my life was changed. I was razzed. I was called names. All of the names, no need repeating them. We all know what they are. And uh, it hurt. It was terrible. And uh, so I became one of those bullied people in school, but I was a good student, and I was in all the plays and the speech clubs and things like that, so I had my own thing, and then oh, being in the, all, and I, my, in high school, my junior and senior year, I actually did the variety shows, so I had an important person, and I was in the upper 10% of the class, and uh, participated as such, but we did have that element where every time when I walked down the halls, I had to deal with that, it, it was terrible. And it hurt, but I was intelligent enough to understand that it was only temporary because I knew I was not going to live there and I knew that I was not going to be a part of them and I knew that I was different from them and I wanted to go to New York. I mean, I went to the movies and I wanted to put on a tuxedo and drink champagne at a nightclub and I wanted to be an actor and I've noticed since I was a kid that I sang and danced and uh, the girls Basically, all my girlfriends protected me to get me through it. And on graduation day in high school, it was like being let out of Leavenworth Prison. I knew I would never be seeing those people again or having anything to do with them because I was going to go to college in Cincinnati at the University of Cincinnati where I was a theater arts major. They didn't have a musical theater major then. So I got a scholarship at the College Conservatory of Music where I had a ballet scholarship. And that was because I had danced in the summer zoo opera ballet where all the stars from the Met came down and worked during the summer and a young girl who was there, Suzanne Ficker, Susie Ficker, who became Suzanne Farrell of the New York City Ballet, uh, we became friends and she made it possible for me to get a, a scholarship with her teacher at the College Conservatory of Music and then I studied dance there and I studied voice there and then my junior year CCM joined the faculty of the university and so I got to transfer some of my credits to make them elective so that I could graduate and uh, then I went on and got my master's and and got my honorary doctor of school so I'm a great believer in that but what happened when I went to college and my family was not educated enough to understand all that I had to do it myself my sister and I have uh, seven siblings, only two of us graduated from high school, and I was the only one who went to college because I had a terrific mom who knew that I was different and special and was going to give me the training because I was going to be in show business and I was going to go to New York City. So when I studied, you know, drama at the university, and of course the, the thing that helped to change my life was that the professor, Paul Rutledge, uh, became my mentor in school and realized that I had talent and gave me special attention and uh, basically my junior and senior year I was directing and choreographing and starring in all the school productions and I had a, 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 a very educated intelligent man who was f so smart and he was an, an image for me to emulate and a, a good role model for me to follow where it was known that he was homosexual. We didn't really use the term gay back then. I knew that basically I was. I hadn't accepted it, but I knew basically what was going on. And that gave me the lead way. And he had also been a psychology major, so he was understood so much. And uh, that 
helped me so much during that period of my life. The four years I spent at the university were the happiest years of my life because we were putting on shows. I was with other people who wanted to be in the theater and believed the same way that I did. And uh, we didn't really talk about our sexuality, uh, but it was well known that, you know, what it was. And I wasn't that sexually active. I certainly wasn't emotionally attached for any of that because we all maintained our privacy. You had to. There was one gay bar over in Covington, Kentucky. I never went to it. But one night we did. We all went, you know, and masqueraded girls and boys from the drama group, the Mummers Guild. We all went one night. And uh, so I experienced all of that. But then when I came to New York, of course, and I got my first job, my first audition with Julia Prowse, and then I did Sweet Charity with Bob Fosse, and then Applause, and all the shows that followed, 10 Broadway shows. So I became a part of the theater community. And of course, the theater, as <laughs> Mel Brooks has always said, if it weren't for the Jews and the gays, we wouldn't have theater. So, and it's true. So, you know, I was lucky because I didn't have to go to gay bars. All I had to do was look in the Chorus Boys dressing room. And they were all certainly attractive, talented, and funny. And so I was blessed to be in that. So that's where I established myself in living in New York. I mean, how lucky can you get the greatest city in the world? And uh, all the minorities are to the forefront here. We have everything in New York. The best and the worst, but we have the best. And so it was accepted in the theater. It wasn't uh, paraded and people masqueraded. And I know that when I was in applause and uh, then later with 42nd Street, I got a Tony nomination. And that was 1980, 81 maybe by that time, between 80, 81, whatever the time frame was there. And uh, the publicist for the show said, well, you know, Leroy, you should probably have a girl be seated with you in the audience because by then my husband now, Bob uh, Donahoe, was living with me. And uh, I allowed that to happen. And that night during the awards, I didn't win, which was fine. Uh, but I allowed, and Bob sat behind me with another girl from the cast because we did have seats. And I felt so guilty that I allowed that to happen. And I made a vow to myself then that I would never allow that to happen again. Not that people didn't know I was gay and that I was in a relationship. Everyone knew that was accepted in the theater. We didn't have a problem about that. But I wouldn't allow someone to tell me again that I cannot sit with the man I love and not have him by my side. So that was a, a sobering moment for me. And I never allowed that to ever happen again or to masquerade or not say who and what I was. And I know that it's, it's, it's quite wonderful, the song in La Cage au Folle, I Am What I Am, which was a line in the show that Harvey Firestein had written. And Jerry Herman said, that's a great line for a song, may I steal it, may it be mine. And Harvey said, yes. And Jerry wrote the song, I Am What I Am, which has become more or less an anthem. And I remember when La Cage, uh, opened on Broadway, I was in the audience because then I was very close friends with Jerry. And I was doing songs from the show uh, at benefits and stuff after that moment. I was one of the first people that started doing songs from the show and Jerry did a routine. And then I ended up being the last replacement on Broadway except they posted the notice after my first week of rehearsal. But I, of course, did many productions afterward. And uh, it became a, a gay anthem. And I remember uh, the opening night that a lot of the press and uh, Michael Musto, the Village Voice, and people like that were saying, well, Jerry, is this your announcement that you're openly gay? And Jerry would not commit. He said, I write songs for the characters in the show. And that song was written for the character in the show. So that was kind of the way it was danced around. Not that Jerry hid his sexuality, everyone knew, but you just weren't that. Harvey Firestein, you know, was very out and open and was there to get on the platform, God bless him, because he made a, a, a wonderful change in the way the people were perceived. And then earlier, back in 1970, to jump back, mm -hmm. that uh, I played a gay character in Applause, which was based on All About Eve, and I was uh, the, uh, the contemporary counterpart of um, 
Oh, the, um, the wonderful lady who, who played it originally. You have to help me with the name. Uh, I'll figure it out later. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 and I, I used her name. It's just that I'm at the age now where the, the names don't come as fast to me. I'll think of it in a minute. But anyway... Uh, that plays important, I think. That was in, you know, All About Eve. And uh, Thelma Ritter. Mm -hmm. Thelma Ritter, I knew she. God bless you, Thelma Ritter. I was the counterpart, the contemporary counterpart of Thelma Ritter. And uh, I, I didn't get the part initially, but then they uh, fired the guy who was playing the part and brought me in during rehearsal in New York. So it became my part, and I, I knew that it was going to be my part. I was very disappointed. Uh, it was New Year's Eve because I didn't get the part, and Bob was cheering me up with a bottle of champagne, and I said that part should have been mine, and the next morning they called, fired the guy, and I went into rehearsal. So I made it funny how things work out. But Ron Field, who was doing that, was very... Uh, did not want the stereotypical uh, f effeminate character and uh, the way that, you know, people would have perceived it to be because he was a gay man, too, and he didn't want it. He wanted him to be an ordinary person, but with a bit of flair. And I also would not play a character like that. I would play him for the reality, and who better to play a gay character and although, you know, my agent at the time said, I don't know whether you should be doing this, you might get typecast. And uh, I thought, but I'm an actor. Why, why do they happen? But they do. And it does happen. And I'm aware of that. But I, I thought, well, why not? Why shouldn't I play it? I am a gay man. Why should I not be playing a gay part? And uh, we played it as such. And it worked well in the show. But I just played him as a real person. And I, the, the, the relationship between Lauren Bacall and myself proved that. That's why the show worked, and that's why Lauren Bacall and I became such close friends for her entire life. I loved her to death, and uh, it, it, it was a, a fascinating time to, to experience all of that. And, uh, of course, I went on after that in my career to do uh, the producers where I wore a dress, to do La Cage aux Folles, where, of course, I was uh, you know, playing the character and also Victor Victoria. And then uh, two years ago, I decided to play Hello Dolly as a woman, because why should we not, as actors, play sex gender also? That the, if I were a woman, I would love to play Professor Higgins and My Fair Lady. So why shouldn't I play Hello Dolly? I love the show. I played Cornelius. I directed it. I directed a lot of women doing it. I know all the original stuff. Uh, I, Carol Channing has been a lifelong friend, so why shouldn't I play the part? Such a good part, and I did. And I was the first uh, uh, professional equity male to play uh, a leading female role in a musical. And, you know, some of the plays, the guys would masquerade, you know, like the importance of being earnest and things like that. The English would do that, but it was the first time in a... In a American musical. So I have it to my credit, and I, I'm very proud of that, as a matter of fact, that we've made those changes because there shouldn't be any stipulations or, or typecasting for any actor. We play the roles, and I, I've never understood it, but it still happens. But we, we've made great strides, but we still have to deal with it. And I know that during the period in the middle 80s, when uh, AIDS was diagnosed and became a part of the forefront, and especially in the arts, where it hit hard. And everyone was scared to death because no one knew who, how to get it. And, and, and then we finally became educated. But in the beginning, there wasn't that. And the hysteria that happened, I mean, there were, I'm not going to mention actresses' names, who didn't want to kiss men in Broadway shows that they knew were gay, afraid they were going to get you know, a fatal disease. And uh, we've become more educated since that time. But there was a bit of hysteria. And it affected Lacage, uh, the show, also. Uh, the fact that, you know, it was all happening and people were being outed, having the disease. And Jerry Herman was, you know, HIV positive. And uh, he's still with us. And so many of the guys survived, but so many of them didn't. And it was very scary. And, and I'll never forget when they did, like, I guess we would consider it the first uh, official AIDS benefit. And Bob Nahas, who 
then owned the Curtain Call restaurant in the Manhattan Plaza, did a luncheon, and Matilda Krim of the AIDS Medical Foundation was going to speak, and it was to raise money for the AIDS Medical Foundation. And uh, none of the males on Broadway would participate. They would not lend their name. This was in the beginning. I did. I was the only male on the list. And the other people were Cheetah Rivera, uh, uh, Dorothy Loudon, uh, Maureen McGovern, uh, Christine Andreas. Um, uh, it, it was incredible, though, Dina Merrill. They were all listed, and I was the only male on the list. And that, that luncheon, Matilda Krim spoke about AIDS and HIV and that it's a, a virus and that it's blood to blood. And she explained all of that. And uh, she said, and you may not know anyone, then you will know someone. And then you may know a friend of one and suddenly it may be you. So she said, this is a virus and it, it's, it's not hard to get, but it is if it's blood to blood, which means of course needles. And she went through the whole procedure. It was quite sobering. And after, I went up to her and I said, uh, Mrs. Krim, I'm a gay man, and uh, I, I want you to be, be specific with me. Uh, what, what is the way that gay men, what is the, the biggest risk? And she said, uh, anal sex, anal penetration. So because the capillaries are, you know, and, and with the semen it can be absorbed. And I said, why don't you say that and why don't people say that? Why, why are we keeping this a secret if that's primarily the way that so many men have been infected? Why isn't that... So eventually it became better knowledge, but back then it wasn't even comfortable to talk about it. In public, especially from a doctor, she didn't get that specific. She did with me privately, but I mean, it, fascinating. And then, of course, we went through that period where all of our friends were dying. And I had done a cruise with Helen Hayes, and Helen Hayes had become a, a big public advocate. They had, at the St. Clair's, they had a wing of the AIDS patients named HIV patients, whatever term we're going to use. Uh, and she would go there, and she went on this cruise. She said, Leroy, would you come and be with me during one of my, you know, journeys when I go to the, to the, the wing? I said, I would be honored, Helen, of course. I'll be there with you. And we walked into this ward, and we saw all of these beautiful young men looking like cadavers in bed. Uh, I will never forget it as long as I live. It just took my breath away. But here I was with Helen Hayes, being like, you know, Clara Barton of the Red Cross or Florence Nightingale, walking with her among the ward. It was hard to do but to put on the facade of entertaining the boys and talking to them, because a lot of them knew the theater, and they knew me, and they certainly knew Helen Hayes, and we sat on the beds and talked to them, and it was an overwhelming experience. I can get very emotional, but I won't, because <clears throat> it was a, a time that I will never forget. And uh, we survived it. And uh, especially with Jerry Herman, who I'm so very close to, and he survived the decades, as did some other people too. And now, and not that we still don't have it, we do. It's just not, it's controlled now, and, and, and the medication now can happen. But that was quite a sobering time to go through in our history. And, um, but anyway, yeah, that's, that's, some of, that's some of our stories. And... Uh, Of course, we, I mean, look at the trouble that we have in the Middle East with sexuality still and the archaic attitudes of the world. I mean, you know, we're, we're all trying and, and we still fight the fight. It's, it, I don't know when you're a minority, I guess you're always going to have the fight, but it's certainly much better. And today it's kind of wonderful that, uh, you know, with the, the wedding of Prince Harry and, and Meghan Markle, today that he's marrying a, a biracial lady and you know and for the first time and also that she walked down the aisle by herself and made a statement we're all still fighting that journey what we have went through recently with you know women 
uh, with the women being, you know, the, the problems they have not being paid equally and uh, also being sexually harassed. And it's, it, we're, we're getting better and better, but we're always going to have the problem because the majority is going to try to always work, or at least what they think the majority is. Well, it's like everybody thinks they're normal. First of all, no one's normal. No one is. There's a lot of gray between the white and the black, and, uh, and we have to learn to accept that. Living in New York, you have to accept it because we have everything here. But in a lot of the cities, you know, everyone feels more comfortable when you look and act like everybody else. And also we fight the religious uh, problems that we have with sexuality and equality. But uh, we're, we're continuing to fight, and we will, and it will get better. And the press, uh, thank God in America, we have a free press. And uh, with all the political stuff that's going on now, thank God we have a free press. It's what makes America great and will continue to make it a great nation. And we don't need those other people who profess to make it great who are doing things they shouldn't be doing. And you know exactly who I'm talking about. So, you know, we're, 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 we're going to survive it. We will. And uh, thank God that we have people like Harvey Milk. And uh, I spoke earlier of uh, Harvey Firestein, who, such a, who stood up and the people who are writing the literature, and uh, the filmmakers who are bringing things to the forefront. So people have to realize that we have more in common than we don't. We all have the, the same feelings, and we also want the same respect. And when people can learn that lesson and learn to do unto others as you would have others do unto you. I mean, if you're going to be religious, then practice what you preach, and don't just pick out the parts you like to highlight read the whole thing. And also we've progressed a lot since that time and we've learned a lot about ourselves. So you can't go back to archaic writings and take them for face value anymore. We've progressed too much for that.